You're listening to Cloud9, where Bahaiteachings.org interviews artists from around the globe to learn about what inspires, uplifts, and motivates them to make a positive contribution to the world. My name is Shadi Talui Wallace. Jamie Heath spent most of his childhood on the road and in the recording studio. You see, Jamie wasn't born into your ordinary family, but they each played a part creating music and performing with the renowned 70s American music duo Seals and Cross. Growing up in such a musical family, Jamie was keen to forge his own path. He landed his first paying gig at the age of 12 and received his first publishing deal at just 18. Today, he continues his family's legacy under the professional name of Jamie Jazz. He's won Grammy Awards, received numerous Emmy nominations, and has written and produced songs for many well-known names in the music industry. But while his love for music is clear, Jamie's life also revolves around the love that he has for his faith and family. In this episode of Cloud9, Jamie recalls his musical upbringing and personal journey, his observations of spirituality in the music industry, how he shares his creative and spiritual ambitions alongside his wife, Natasha, and how he has chosen to honor the memory of his grandmother, Marsha Day. Jamie He, thank you so much for joining us on Cloud9. Shadi, shadi. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. I feel completely um, honored to be talking to you and probably unqualified, And um, but hey, I'll fake my way through it. <laughs> Uh, that makes two of us. Uh, so, Jamie, I know that you're currently based in L.A., but is this where your musical journey began? Uh, um, so I was born and raised into a very successful family in music, a group called Seals and Crofts. I um, mean, the 70s were a very big group, had a lot of hits. Um, they also were Baha'is. My grandmother was their manager and kind of like the engine and all my uncles were involved somehow. My uncle Louis Shelton was the producer of Sills and Crofts. My uncle Joey Bogan was their engineer. So I was born, literally raised in a recording studio. Um, I have a family, Sills and Crofts are my uncles. In fact, I was named after them for anyone who knows them. It's James Seals and Daryl Crofts. My name is James Daryl, legally. And um, in the 70s, they were really big, had a lot of hits. My grandmother was their manager and kind of the engine. Uh, um, my uncle Louis Shelton was their record producer. My uncle Joey Bogan was their engineer. My uncle Louis Lazarga was their photographer as well as other things. My father, who was signed to a and Records, was like basically kind of an opening act for them also on the road. Um, and then they all were married to my grandmother, Marcia Day. Um, her five daughters were all married to someone, one of those uncles. So I was literally born and raised into a musical family where everything was music in the studio where the Jacksons recorded Off the Wall, um, Elton John, Billy Joel, Shaka Khan, Rufus, um, and a host of other people. I was just in the studio. So I don't really have any memory um, that didn't involve music and artistry and um so I kind of was groomed for that if I didn't. And I had a little bit of talent, hopefully um, enough to, uh, well, apparently I did. I was able to work um, for most of my life, all of my life, really. And, um, but aside from the talent, I didn't know anything else. So had I not had a bit of talent, I probably most likely would be uh, on your front doorstep asking to stay with you. <laughs> You're always <laughs> I know, welcome. <laughs> I, know, I know nothing else. I mean, this is such a powerhouse of names that you just mentioned like what is your earliest memory as a child being in, in this atmosphere where you're on the road with these guys or mostly I, just in the studio i was on the home? road yeah i was on the road quite a bit because my family so i mentioned were all involved my grandmother being the manager who i live with a lot of my life my mother also who um helped manage um so we'd be on the road quite a bit i got to play bass with them when i was either seven or eight wow. um, um so is that like your first instrument stage. My first instrument was piano when I was like four or five, but the first one that I really claimed was bass that was my thing. Um, you, know, you know, I played bass in a bunch of bands, rock bands, and, and um, but piano was always kind of like the root of everything I did, but um, I didn't really realize that was cool to do until I was about maybe 14. 
So when did you get your first paying gig as a musician? Because I know that can kind of be a turning point for a lot of aspiring artists. I, I had my first professional paid gig when I was about 12, uh, almost 13 years old. Um, the music that I did, I'm sure stunk if I were to listen back to it. However, someone paid me to do it. So um, I was theoretically working man at that time. Um, and then that led me um, to another thing, to another thing. I started getting involved with producing a lot for Latin America, um, writing songs and producing because uh, I had a partner at the time that was involved in that and that became my world. So by the time I was about 17, I was full-time doing that. And then I pretty much stopped that because I um, was interested in being a rock star. Um, you know, I was going to be the next, I don't know, whoever, uh, Prince or uh, Jimi Hendrix or something. I don't know. Um, and uh, so I followed that dream, which led me to um, producing for a lot of different artists in the American market. And I got some luck and, you know, landed something here and there. And, and I just kept going, got a publishing deal when I was about 18. And, um, and then my life just only was music. I didn't have any other job except for I worked at an ice cream shop for one day. And um, that's my only other job besides music. <laughs> Were you, like, the, your, their family had such a history in music and, and quite, like, a lot of ambition. Is that something that intimidated you? It doesn't sound like it. But did you kind of reflect on on your own ability at all in that process? And like, did, did were you inspired by it? Did it motivate you? Or did you feel kind of intimidated by it all? I certainly was not intimidated. I didn't know, honest yeah. to God, like I didn't know anything else but music. That was just, it was like a second nature. Um, it was, um, so intimidation certainly wasn't the factor. If anything, it was just encouraging everyone around me was encouraging i had outlets there was my, like nothing else there was just <laughs> like, nothing this else is the path. everything was yeah. at my disposal of a professional recording studio at such a young age i just had the cues to that i was in tearing apart um rebuilding costing them money to have people come in and fix what i broke but never really reprimanded for it because it was um all understood that this was seemingly what would be my journey in my life um so no, there was never any intimidation. It was only support and encouragement and um, confirmation. So fast forward to today, where has this musical journey led you to? Can you share a bit about what you're working on at the moment? Well, as we know, since music has changed so much, um, nobody sells records anymore. Budgets have gone down a fraction of what they used to be. Um, publishing deals are hard to come by because there is real no money to be made. Um, except for in certain circles, climates. Um, so I was fortunate to like make transition into scoring, um, scoring for television, um, a lot of webisodes, film. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the studio scoring, you know, doing cues, underscores. Um, and uh, that's been keeping me extremely busy as well. Of course, I still do records, you know, I've been fortunate to do some stuff with some great people and, um, um, one of them, some of us know Andy Grammer. I've been able to work with him. He's a good friend, but also, um, you know, I get to work with him on his record. So just right now we're doing something now, which is nice. Um, and, um, and I'm also doing a lot of mixing, sound mixing and designing for TV shows. So TV shows, of course, need. Are you allowed to tell us what TV shows you're working on? I mean, I'm happy to, but they're like, um, you know, other than one show that is super inspirational and inspiring, um, called My Last Days, which I do the mixing for and all the scoring for, which is about uh, people who are facing death through terminal illness. And it's really kind of following their last days and seeing the joy that they emit to the world and what they're doing with their last moments. From a musical perspective, what inspires you as an artist to be a part of My Last Days? You know, um, this show, uh, which is really special, um, Justin Baldoni, um, this was pretty his brainchild. and. Um, along with a couple of people, Soul Pancake was involved in the beginning, and his partner, Ahmed, who um, created this show, which really um, shows the humanity and the perseverance and the, um, just the love and heart of people. And um, so it follows these individuals. Uh, um, and rather than showing their... Um, their detriment and, and, and their sadness, which of course exists, 
It shows what they want to do with their last days. And when you watch something like that, for me, and I see what people are doing when life really matters, when their time is short, it's inspiring in the sense of like, what am I doing? How am I matching that? And most of the time, I'm not. So I see that. Um, that certainly is moving to me because they film it and they send it to me once it's been edited and all you know uh, put together. And always I get emotional. Um, so I watch it a few times and um, you know pray to God that maybe I can do some justice with some music that might uh, not manipulate an audience, but rather just support their story and give it a little bit of um, you know a little bit of movement to it. Um, and um, but it's super inspiring in the sense of you just see the best of humanity and, and people, unfortunately, when they're faced with crisis and um, certainly dying is crisis for even though it's a, a gift of joy that we know from God, really, it's like we're going back to, to our maker. But for for so many around, it's such a crisis moment. And uh, and to see the way that they handle it. And to see their humanity is super, super inspiring and makes, in those moments, the music that I do for that, the most important music I've ever done in my life because it's done with the spirit of God in it. And, um, and with no real, I mean, sure, I'm paid decently for it, but it's not about money and it's not about that. It's just about service. And, um, and it feels good to do that. It's almost like you're using the time that you have left to like, highlight the joy that that life brings because you can't really tap in physically into what they're experiencing what they're feeling but through music you're able to have empathy but also Mm -hmm. reflect on like where you're at in your life and like taking advantage of every moment and reflecting and and making those changes that you feel are necessary agreed but next time somebody asks me that question, I'm going to have you answer for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to like, yeah, put words in your mouth, but reflecting no, on what you good. were sharing. Um, so you spoke about God. You could talk a little bit about how you became a Baha'i or how you came into the Baha'i faith, your own journey. The short version is I was born into a Baha'i family. Um, I mentioned Marsha Day, who was the matriarch of, of our whole family. She was the first Baha'i. Um, she found the faith um, 50 plus years ago. Um, all of her daughters, who are five of them, um, found the faith as well through her. And, um, and all of my uncles and my father were Baha'is. So I was raised with a lot of cousins who were all Baha'is, raised with these principles. Um, but as you know, um, being raised a Baha'i is different than being a Baha'i, owning it for yourself at the age of 15, really, at the age of maturity, when you kind of um, are charged with having your own relationship with God and not through your parents. And so I was fortunate to be raised um, with really good principles. Um, and, and I think a bit of uh, the lenses to recognize truth. And when I was 15, I certainly recognized it and knew that I wanted this to be my life and knew that I wanted to um, spread this throughout the world because it seemed to be the only thing that truly worked. But I also knew that I could do that through music. Um, so I've tried my best to kind of marry the two, um, sometimes successfully and many times, of course, not. But, um, you know, that was pretty much the simple version of how I became a Baha'i, just being exposed to it. Sometimes I get super jealous of, like, my wife who, like, found the faith at 25 years old and knew the difference of never having it and then finding it, um, whereas I always knew this truth. But that doesn't also take away from the fact that I did recognize it. I did take it for myself and um, stumbled along the way, probably stumbled more than than many, um, but um, always certainly knew which way North was. Mm -hmm. Now, you spoke about how you try and marry the two. What And often I, I love to look at the lens of an artist, but each individual artist has its own, like, has their own perception I would love to learn a bit more about how do you marry the Baha'i faith with your music and how that experience is, has looked for you Yeah, in particular. Um, there's always been some common denominator. Um, while it's changed a bit throughout my life as I've learned how to maybe um, do it a bit better. or, But you know, when I was young, I remember my grandmother telling me, I was maybe uh, 14, 13 or 14. 
And I was working a lot in music. All I did was spend time in the studio. Sometimes I did school not to go and play with friends, but rather to be in the studio um, writing and playing music. Um, and when it was pretty clear that my life was going to be of music, she had said to me, um, I want to share something with you. You have the potential to make a lot of money, to be super successful, to get a lot of accolades, to have people look up to you, to praise your name, all of these things. Um, and while that's wonderful, God doesn't love you or want these things for you more than the guy who lives next door to you. The only reason why you have these things is to be of service to humanity. That's the only reason. The only reason why you're able to play piano is so that you can play for other people. The only reason why you have this studio here and you'll have your own studios as you grow up is so that you can make sort of music for humanity. The cool thing about it is, is you also get to like experience the joy of it, right? You get, you, hopefully you'll make some money and you can buy a home and a nice car and travel the world. And these are some of the perks. But don't lose fact, sight of the fact that the only reason why you have it is to be of service. And if you're not doing that, then you're basically slapping God in the face and it's, there's no point in you having it. So I remember her saying that to me really clearly because she looked at me in the eyes, sat me down, and it really resonated with me. So I've gone through my life in music um, always with this mentality of having a recording studio, which I was able to, to have all of my life. And if I was asked to do something um, that was of service, there was no money involved. Um, if it was for someone who was doing it for the spirit of God or for a group of people that was of service, to, to do it without any sort of monetary thought. Um, that was always in my mind. Um, and I always did do that. Well, I don't want to say always, but mostly did that. And what's interesting is when I started getting successful and making money, and I still did it, but I did lose sight of that for a while. And when I lost sight of that, shortly, I started losing everything. My sight, my, my, when I say my sight, my spiritual sight, um, work started slowing down. Um, and it was exactly as she said. There was no, God had no purpose in me having this gift if I wasn't using it for others. Um, I was able to see that like, you know, just right in my face. So, so the, the ways I do that change, of course, year to year, however I'm able to do it, whether it's singing at a fireside and, or singing um, at an you know, old person's home. That's not the PC way to say that, right? Old person's home. What is it? Is it like... Age. <laughs> age and age home. I don't know. Um, singing, of course, in our community in that way. But even more so in my professional world, um, I'm always a yes person first. When people need something, if it's anything that I know is um, of good merit, not just because they're trying to make money, but it's a project that's of good merit, I just say, yes, I'll do it the money, whatever you can pay me, you pay me. If that's $5, I accept. And if it's 5,000, I accept. doesn't matter. I'm in, I'll do it. And I literally live by that rule and I always do it. And it's surprising how amazing of all times, except for one experience, people show up and pay you more than I would have ever asked for because I've come to it with like, I'm in, I just want to use whatever gift I have and help you realize what you're doing. Um, so that's one of the ways that I'm able to like marry this concept of service with my gift. Um, more specifically, you know, like in terms of direct teaching of God, um, you know, that changes with person to person. You know, I'm sure you experience that. Some some people are more open to having spiritual conversations and having it in our music, um, mm -hmm. and other people are like, "No way! I want to write about sex, drugs, and rock and roll," and um, I'm like, okay, they're paying me. I have to work, but how can we make it sex, drugs, rock and roll, and a little spirit rally? <laughs> With a bit of God in there. <laughs> With a little bit of God in there. Um, um, you know, so it, it morphs, it changes, of course, project to project, but I am mindful going into every single one that the only reason why that I have any gift that I have is to be of service and to do it first with that mentality, and the rest then comes from that. Being so like active in the music industry, especially in Los Angeles, I'm sure you see this huge kind of divide between creative and like creatively spiritual or spiritually creative. 
what is kind of your observation? And you mentioned you'd like turn down a few jobs. Is there like a huge divide or do you think things are starting to change because people are starting to be more in tune with their their purpose and like this these ideals of of spirituality? Like what is kind of your observation of the notion of spirituality and your line of work and the industry that you work in? Yikes. Yeah, wow. Um, um, most of my life, it has, it has been non-existent in my experience. Um, spirituality was not cool. Um, for certain groups, um, to be honest, like with Black artists, it's different because they're very, very proud of, you know, being a part of a Baptist church and the singing and where it comes from. And there's a bit more there. And certainly to praise Jesus's name has been beautiful and wonderful. Um, but at the same time, it's been riddled with me, 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 and how do I come up and um, material aspirations, which is great. But um, in the last, God, I don't know how many years it's been, you know, like five, eight years in my work, I've noticed it's almost, it's cool to be spiritually conscious. Um, everyone doesn't call it spiritual consciousness. You know, it's, it's like just to be good. Um, um, people call it the universe or, um, you know, and giving back seems to be more cool. So I'm not sure if everyone started doing it because they felt it or whether just to be a part of the craze, but whether you, if when you're of service or connected to God, it doesn't matter what the reason is, it affects your soul. So eventually it becomes truth for you, even if it started out as just a craze. So I've now experienced that almost everyone that I work with in conversations in my, in this industry has some sort of sense of spiritual connection, um, is interested in having, um, whether they call it God or not, having that element involved. And, um, and people aren't resistant to it. Yeah. It's very, very rare that I, that I come across that. Of course there are, there are those every now and again, but, um, they're really far and few between. Yeah. I, um, I play in a band here in Vancouver and I came across kind of like a dilemma for myself. And I, I really, as a, as a woman in the music industry, as, as a kind of nascent as I, I am, um, entering into the music industry, I felt kind of a bit lost about like, where, who, who can I refer to or who can I ask for guidance? Because these, these dilemmas are like, like spiritual dilemmas. And I actually went to a friend of mine who's a producer here and he's a, he's in like the Christian kind of rock scene here and it was so um it was so helpful to me to be able to have Mm. this dialogue with him because he had this underlying kind of understanding of our purpose as as being of service and um as as being kind of reflections of god's attributes and and it was so helpful because I didn't feel like I could talk to anybody else, even other women. It wasn't just like a woman dilemma. It was like a, a spiritual female dilemma that I was experiencing and I uh, needed needed some help. But he was like the only person I could go to. So it didn't really matter what faith um, or background he was from. But like having that mm. spiritual foundation was so... Um, and he was a guy too, but he's, you know, he was experiencing the same kind of dilemmas that I'm experiencing now a few years ago. Um, but it was so helpful to have that conversation with him because we all recognize that we're spiritual identities primarily and then material. Second. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, that's, um, that's inspiring to like, just to know that that's happening in our, well, in the world and of course then in our, in our field, but, um, certainly makes life more enjoyable, um, when you can incorporate that. Yeah, absolutely. And just have that to relate, to relate with or relate through. And that dichotomy and, doesn't need to exist necessarily. Like No, it does not. Yeah. I mean, it's, it always has. But, you know, and I try to also, you know, with a lot of artists, I'll like pull out a quote here and there that I kind of, um, some that means something to me and um, ask if we can start with uh, not even necessarily a prayer, but like, a, a, a writing that means something to me that might be inspirational in the, the field that we're doing. And it's always received super receptively, you know, it's uh, and that helps to just bring the spirit of God um, into it. Um, and ultimately, you know, most of them up highs um, will share something of their own, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, That's- do you think that the spirit of God could be in 
any art form without putting a word or like like you know this semantic of spiritual that we use like we don't necessarily have to have that it's just what the motivation is behind it agreed yeah i mean obviously there's the teachings of god Mm -hmm. um we know like in terms of compassion and just common goodness and kindness and love and and uh loyalty and honesty or you know any of these things that we um if we write songs with some of those themes um then certainly the teachings of god are in there right and um and infused with that whether you you know cite the source or not and um you know and of course i try to do that as much as possible um doesn't always work sometimes it's like you know like i wrote a song with this one girl i won't name her name but i was like can we really write this like really like you want to write this <laughs> um and yeah. I'm like, well, how about we just, I mean, let's be clear that it says lyrics by you and music <laughs> by us, you know? <laughs> so, so what but, are your, um, what are your aspirations uh, as a musician and as a, a father and as a Baha'i? What do you hope? What are your dreams? What are your hopes? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is your hope and dream? <laughs> yes, that is true. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, you know, Shadi, um, um, if I were to like say something personal, but like in my life, so I've, I've, um, I built a wonderful life for myself. Um, and then I pretty much pissed it away because I made some stupid choices and I lost sight of my purpose. And, um, and in that process, um, burned a lot, a lot of people, too many people, um, hurt those that were super close to me. And, um, and as a result of that, I lost pretty much everything that meant anything to me, um, including um, my ability to create music um, authentically and, and, and therefore wasn't working for a good period of time. I could not get arrested in, in, in my field because um, I had just, I hadn't burned those bridges, but it was almost, um, I just didn't have any spirit in me to create work that someone would want to hire me for because of um, some of the dumb stuff that I was involved in at the time. And it took some time to rebuild and to find my joy and um, my worth again. And, um, and this time around, I'd say, um, since being able to rebuild a life, rebuild my music and um, a family and I've the most amazing, wonderful, incredible wife, um, this is true. Four children. I've met her. You know her. Know she her. is incredible and wonderful. <laughs> she is. Uh, um, I am undeserving of her, but um, you know, you don't say no to gifts from God. You just say thank you, and you do the best you can with that. Um, and um, and I've got four children. You know, all the way aged from like I think the oldest is eighty, and the youngest is two days old. Something. <laughs> it feels like that. <laughs> uh, Wait, how old is she really? <laughs> what? Who, uh, what, Jasmine Your daughter, is, yeah. She is, um, wait, what? Did I say that out loud? I think, <laughs> I think, I say she's 18. She'll tell you she's 28. Yeah, but, she's, I remember she's uh, the same age as me. Watch your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you feel old now? <laughs> oh, my God. She is wonderfully, beautifully 28 years old. Um, I was a kid having a kid, um, very young, and um, she is everything. And, um, and of course, I have Nak Giovanni, who's 15, and then I have Breakwell, who's two, and Day, who's almost seven months. Um, but and the, the the newest two, of course, to the two year old and six month old, and um, and Natasha is my wife. So I've been able to rebuild a life, um, but only through completely submitting to God, um, to my understanding of God, and um, and recommitting the fact that whatever I have left with music, which apparently was a lot, um, to fully honor what my grandmother had said to me when I was a boy, um, to be of service with it and to really use that first. And I make this claim with almost anyone that I meet. Like, if you need something, my answer is yes. I'll do it for you. Money doesn't even have to exist. Just my pleasure. And... um, and with that spirit and, of course, you know, changing a few other things, um, my life has been 
really super wonderful and blessed and reconnected. And um, so my, your original question, I think, was like, what's my, asp- my aspirations? Well, my aspirations, of course, is to create good art in whatever medium I'm doing it in. But, um, but mostly to use it um, with as many people who need it, who don't have the means to pay um, what they m- most of the time have to pay and then therefore can't use it, to, um, to be someone that can be of service to those. Um, and, uh, that's, and to do it with joy. Um, and no looking back and no complaints about how little someone pays or not. Um, that's like my aspiration to be joyful and to um, be appreciative of every thing that I'm able to acquire and develop and piece of joy, because I had a long period when I didn't have any of that by my own hand, like no one else's fault, my own stupidity, but I certainly, um, that's, that's my, that's my biggest, um, aspiration. Well, that's incredibly noble. And it helps to, I think, share that with other artists so that you can collaborate and work together and you can connect and network with other people who need it most. Um, Mm. You spoke so beautifully about Natasha. I know she's also an artist and a beautiful dancer. I want to learn a little bit about how you support each other, both both spiritually and creatively, because I find that you have a wonderful relationship that is mutually kind of mutually beneficial for both of your spiritual and material progress. So I'd love Mm. to learn a little bit about how you encourage each other both in those ways. Yeah. Um, We do that really well. I've learned from some mistakes. I used to be married to uh, a woman, uh, my son, Nick Giovanni's mom, who uh, is super talented. Like she's super, super talented and wonderful at music. And um, while I didn't, um, I didn't ever hinder her, um, I was not supportive of her through our marriage. I did not honor her and like lift her and do everything I could to, for her to realize her, her dreams and, uh, or even just um, run to the studio or the first thing she did when she came back to say like, uh, let me hear what you did. Um, I'm not sure what that was about. It wasn't competition, but I didn't give it to her. And I know she needed it. And I imagine I hurt her very much during that time. And um, so I learned um, through that um, how to be better. Um, unfortunately for her, she was uh, she had to go through it, but it wasn't all in vain. Um, she's still a good friend now. And, she, and I now have learned to honor Natasha so much for her art and um, to champion her and to um, to do exactly those things that I didn't before when she walks in like tell me what you're doing today with your music or your, or your dance and your art and um, or she'll be around the house dancing and creating a piece that she has for an idea for a project and it's like let me drop everything and watch what you're doing it takes five minutes and it's like five days of joy for her for five minutes of time for me um, so um, you know, I, I try to do that the best I can. And I'm generally interested, but I also know that it requires effort. And she is just, um, she doesn't require any effort on her part. She just, is just perfect in those ways. She just supports me and loves me and asks about my music all the time. And um, um, when I need to go to the studio and I'm gone three days, literally three days, um, the studio's across the street, thank goodness. But um, it's only support and love. Um, she doesn't really have to work hard to do anything good. She just is. I, on the other hand, have to try every day. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for her to hear this. Although I know I know that you're very vocal about your affection for her, but it's always nice to hear. It never gets old, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've we we have a good marriage for sure. We both put some effort into it and um and art, of course, for some people can be challenging and maybe combative, but for us we've learned how to uh um really be supportive and, and honor each other, and um, mm. champion each other. And then therefore also in the faith, like with, with projects um, regarding uh, service, um, I always try to incorporate her wherever I can have her dance to something I'm doing or um, ask her thoughts about songs I'm singing, um, you know, just include her and make her present in all that I do. Mm. Um, when I'm working with artists new artist all the time that she's ever met it's like i want them to meet her right away i want her her to be present in my life even when she's not present of course that helps 
Um, so we're just coming to a close. I just wondered if you had any advice for other artists out there, young and old. Use your art to be of service first. I can just pass on what I learned from my grandma. Use it first, no matter what. I know sometimes you want money for it and you're deserving of it. But if you're of service first and you do it in those ways without the care of money, I know and promise, certainly if you're talented, the money will come another way. The money will for sure come. But if you can put, attach God to what you're doing, just say yes, and the rest will come somewhere else. Wonderful way to end this conversation. Thank you, Jamie Heath, so much for joining us today. Oh, my goodness. I got to talk to Shadi, <laughs> who's like, by the way, one of my favorite ever. And then you know every time we go, like, if I'm somewhere and I see you, it's I like, know, you oh, I'm not singing. You don't give me any time to prepare. <laughs> no, of course not. I just want to just open your mouth and sing. Hello. It doesn't, doesn't matter if you know the words or the melody. Just sing. You're so kind. I always uh, love it. Yeah, I feel like if, if it's Jamie Heath calling me up on stage, it doesn't it doesn't matter how much I screw up. I just you have this presence about you that it's just it's just all fun. It should be all fun and joyful. Mm. And that's always very special. You <laughs> you are a sweet sensation that we love so very much and with such a Aww. great talent. And you are one that does give your music and your art to humanity. And um, that's inspiring and lovely. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to to talk to you. Thank you so much for asking. Thank you for your time again. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to Cloud9. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to check out Bahaiteachings.org where you can find more Baha'i-inspired podcasts, videos, and articles. <laughs>